Ja. Okay. Today is December the 15th, 2020. Glad you're with us this evening. We'll prepare ourselves to study God's Word by having a few moments of silent prayer. During that time, we have the option of naming privately to God the Father any unconfessed sins which ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness and for your word. We thank you for doing everything that is necessary in order to get us here to help us to concentrate and focus. We pray that you will help us to file away in our long-term memory the things that we learned this evening and that we'll be able to apply them through the Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Excuse me. I have a Christmas card that we have from Rowdy. Y'all know who Rowdy is in Pennsylvania. And the card is uh, says, especially for you at Christmas. I'm not going to read the part on the card. It's just uh, special thoughts. Well, I guess, well, special thoughts with warmest wishes and for your happiness at this time of Christmas, may the coming year be filled with good things for you. This is what Rowdy says. Howdy, he says, howdy, howdy Christmas, y'all. I just wanted to tell everyone at CBC how much I hope and pray that you are well and safe this Christmas season. Everyone and the congregation is continually in my prayers and thoughts. I'm sending much love and warm thoughts your way in hopes that you'll have an enriching and joyous holiday season. Everyone here in the Gap Prayer Circle and study group sends uh, their love and warm wishes as well. He has a prayer circle every, every night. Uh, they get in his room and they hold hands in a circle and they pray for uh, various things. So we thank him for that. We also have a Christmas card from Dan and Pat Hill. You all know who they are, missionaries over to Africa. Jesus, the very first and most beautiful Christmas ever. is the most, the most beautiful Christmas gift ever given. Country Bible Church, Merry Christmas to you all, Dan and Pat. So maybe we can get these put up on the bulletin board. We're going to have to clean it up, though. This, <laughs> I, I, I think the things that are on there are probably from 2016, something like that. Okay, before we begin, I found a few things. I was looking for some pictures. And I have three pictures here that, let me just say they're unusual. They have to do with sporting events, and it's the timing and placement of the camera when they took the picture that makes these, I will say, unusual. I just have three of them. The first one is a shocker. Well, they all are a little bit that way. Oh, I will we'll have to. I didn't turn on the projector. We'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> Excuse me. I'll show you, you never have seen. Um, a picture like, especially like this first one. And it's, you know, they have these uh, software that you can make it look like it's real, but it's not. They'll take something, drag it over into something. But this isn't. This is real. Uh, 
<laughs> of course, this is uh, a gymnast, I guess it is. And <laughs> her, this is her front foot. <laughs> her back foot is coming up and her head is back. Isn't that, that strange? The timing and the angle had to be just perfect for that. Here's the second one. <laughs> and you think you had a hard day at work. <laughs> yeah, he looks like he's smiling. <laughs> uh, I, it looks like his horn at the end is kind of, you know, like the guys that ride bulls, they blunt those horns. And it looks like that one on top may be blunted, and I bet this guy's very happy about that. Here, here's the third one. He was only about a foot off with his hands. <laughs> you can tell these are real pictures that, the way everybody's looking. That's the instant that it hit him. Anyway, I thought those were interesting. I thought I would share those with you. They had some others that were not quite this, this good, I didn't think. <clears throat> okay, let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter 2. We kind of started this last time, just spent just a, a few moments in it, so I thought, well, we'll just start anew. And this is, like I said, is Romans chapter 2, verse 1. Oh, okay. No, I wonder why... It should be showing now. Let me turn it off and come back on. Well, maybe it came out. I'm going to take it out. There you go. Mm -hmm. Me. Right now. Okay. Therefore, you are without... Excuse every man of you who passes judgment, for in that you judge another, you condemn yourself, for who you judge practice the same things. You who judge practice the same things. Now, you would think, well, we, we could take care of this in five minutes. But we're transitioning from chapter 1 to chapter 2, and there are some things we need to point out to begin with. So we'll look at the introduction one more time. I doubt that you remember it from last Thursday. In Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 21, Paul asserted that humans can know God through creation. That's the big deal there. God related him, revealed himself through his creation, and every person can understand that there is a God and a lot of people know that there's God. That's what the scripture says. They know he is God, but they suppress the truth and start worshiping idols and creation and things of that sort because they don't want to be held accountable. And we saw all the uh, horrible things in the list from, I think it's verse 28 uh, or 29 on. There are 17 sins that these uh, unbelievers commit. So <clears throat> they are without excuse. In Romans chapter 2, verse 14 through 15, Paul also asserted that all humans have an inner moral conscience given by God. These two witnesses, that would be creation and the moral compass that we have 
within ourselves uh, are the basis for God's condemnation of all mankind, even though even those who have not been exposed to the Old Testament or the gospel message. I don't know how many people are unbelievers because they rejected the revelation of God through his creation or how many have rejected the gospel. But at those two points, people make a decision that will determine their eternal destiny. Here now we have more about chapter 2. Paul now draws conclusion from his argument in chapter 1 and switches to, di to direct address you. <clears throat> That's second person, by the way. And what that means, when he was talking uh, in chapter 1 about all these things, he wasn't talking directly to them. It was like there was a straw man. It was just these were the things that were happening. But now he switches from the third person to the second person and he's talking about talking to them and about them in the second person he escalates his rhetoric and switches focus to those who know the law and finally to Jews specifically now in chapter 2 until you get to what is it I think it's verse uh, let's see 16 I think it is uh, that uh, he could be talking to the uh, Gentiles and Jews alike. But when he gets to chapter 2, verse 21, uh, then he's going to be talking directly to the Jews. In Romans chapter 2, verse 1 through 16, Paul addresses the hypocrisy of those Jews or Gentiles who condemn others but sin themselves which we'll get to tonight. They may not experience God's wrath in the present, but they will in the future. In Romans 2, 6 through 8, Paul describes God's expectations in terms of both Jews and Gentiles, which is, I, that's what I was referring to, would have recognized. Again, Paul describes God's expectations in terms of that both Jews and Gentiles would have recognized. Then in verses 9 through 16, he affirms the priority of Israel, but notes that they have priority in judgment as well. Isn't that something? The Jews have priority. They are God's chosen people, but they also have priority when there is judgment. <coughs> Exposing hypocrisy has to do with verses 1 through 5. Paul exposes the hypocrisy of those who acknowledge God's truth and condemn immorality but practice the same things they condemn. They will not escape God's judgment. Righteousness is a word that means something according to a standard. If you're going to let somebody come into your home they are going to meet the standards that you have set. God is the same way. If he is going to let somebody come into heaven, he is the one who sets the standard. He wants them to measure up to his standard, and he is not going to let them in just because they think they have the right to be there. I can remember when I was a child, I was probably six years old, something like that, and there were some people that came in to visit. And my dad didn't even know they were coming. They just showed up. And they came in and they were smoking cigarettes, which everybody did back in that day for the most part. But they also opened up a, a bottle of whiskey and started drinking it right out of the bottle. And my dad was a teetotaler. And he was really concerned. For some reason, it really concerned him that they were drinking out of a bottle and not a glass. I mean, that made it worse somehow. And that was enough for him to just, you know, he was being polite. I don't know if they were just an acquaintance or how well they knew each other. 
But he gave them a, an alternative. He says, either you put that away or you'll have to leave. And I can't remember for sure. I think they left, but I'm not for sure. But the whole point was they didn't meet his standard when they came, came into his house. And when we, whenever any of us goes to someone else's home, then we have to meet their standard, whatever it is. Nowadays, if you go to someone's house and you're a smoker and you go inside and light up in there, you're probably going to get tossed out because that's uh, not allowed. That's one of the standards. You don't, you don't uh, smoke. Or it could be you're in somebody's house and you start using vulgar language or take God's name in vain, something like that. They will let you know right away. We don't talk that way in this house. And if you're going to continue to do that, you'll have to leave. That's what, that's what he's talking about here. <clears throat> now, righteousness is a standard. And God's standard for, for anyone to come into his house and to come into heaven, it doesn't matter if you think you have a right to be there. You don't. And his standard is so high, only he can meet it. And so the standard for getting into heaven is having God's righteousness. He's not going to compromise his essence or his attributes in any way. And you know where that's going. Only those who have put their faith alone in Christ alone, and the moment they did it, had God's own righteousness imputed to them. And so they are qualified to go into heaven because they have met the standard because of the grace of God giving his righteousness to us as a gift, along with eternal life and other things as well. So when the Bible refers to a standard, it uses the word righteousness. When it refers to the application of that standard, it uses the word justice. And the two words have essentially the same root, dikaio or dikai. And that can be used in different forms, but it's and it, and it can be used for righteousness or justice. So it's depending, depending on whether that word is used for a standard, it would be translated righteousness. But if it's referring to the application of that standard, then it would be justice. So we know that there is a perfect righteousness because it exists in God's essence and the application of that righteousness is perfect justice. You have perfect righteousness and perfect justice. I can remember when I was going to Baraka Church, I heard this so many times and if you went there as well, you probably heard it as well. And that would be the uh, R.B. theme, Jr., affectionately known as the colonel, would say, what the righteousness of God demands, the justice of God carries out. And we have a, when you think of the pipeline, you have righteousness on the top, you have justice down here. And when the justice, I mean the righteousness of God, the standard is blessing, then it goes down through a pipeline to the justice of God and the justice of God carries that out. If you, if you didn't go to Baraka, and if you haven't seen the Grace Pipeline, you will one of these days. Uh, it has to do with blessings. But that's what this whole book is about. In verse 16 and 17 of chapter 1, it talks about the righteousness of God. It is good that the God's righteousness is perfect. The only problem is that nobody can meet it. And he took care of that with, through the cross and the imputation of his righteousness to us. As chapter 1 was being read to the Romans, most of them were probably totally on board with him, agreeing with him, applauding and saying, Amen. Yeah, look at these... These people who rejected you and all these horrible sins they're doing, boo. And then they, when they heard 
Chapter 2, it got quiet. Why? Because the letter, the epistle started talking about them. So here is chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore you are out, excuse me, therefore you are without excuse, every man of you who passes judgment, for in that year you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. Now we have the word therefore. And you've heard me say for this, uh, whenever you see that, you need to know what it's there for. It's the Greek word uh, for therefore is the same one used in chapter 24. It is not the normal Greek word that is found for therefore, which is uh, un. We would say un, but it's got the O-U-N. It's, that's the normal word for therefore, but it is dio, D-I-O. And I have more to say about that here. In chapter 1, verse 24, therefore acts sort of a, a, as sort of an introduction to the section dealing with the wrath of God towards immoral degeneracy of men. Here it is. Romans 1, 24. Therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity, that their bodies might be dishonored among men. And it goes on from there. But it, introdu it introduces God's denunciation of those who do not meet his righteous standard and those who have suppressed the truth. So it acts as a as an introduction to the section dealing with his wrath that is poured out on those who are immoral, they're into immoral degeneracy. You see, I have it in red there. Then, where we are now in verse 2, that same word is used and it, it introduces the wrath of God towards moral degeneracy of men. So we have two kinds of degeneracy here. And I wanted to point that out. Another thing I want to point out, I'll go back up here to verse 1, that therefore is akin to the one in verse 24 introducing something about immoral degeneracy and the wrath poured out on it. This time it is the same word, an introduction, but this time it's not about immoral degeneracy, it's about moral degeneracy, which he is going to elaborate on. And then the next phrase here, it says, you are without excuse. Actually, when you look at this in the Greek, you have therefore, dio, which is setting up it's an introducing something here, just like it did in chapter 1, verse 24. And it just says, therefore, excuse. In other words, in Greek, they take, if they want to emphasize something, they will take it and put it right at the first. If it wasn't for therefore setting this up, the first word in the Greek would be excuse. So he's, the statement that he's making here is emphasized. He's going to say something about you are without excuse. That's thrown right up at the front because that's what he is really explaining or, or, or emphasizing here. And we'll get on to that now. One more time, I'm going to read this. In Romans 1.24, the therefore acts as sort of an introduction to the section dealing with the wrath of God towards the immoral degeneracy of all those sins that we've been studying. Then, here we are now in chapter 2, verse 1, and it starts out, therefore, it's the same word, it's introduction, introducing uh, again <coughs> the wrath of God being uh, going towards, this time, the moral degeneracy of men. 
So we find that there are two different categories of degeneracy and God condemns both of them. The pagan immoral, immoral degenerate rejects the object of faith, which is God. Remember? They suppress the truth of God. So they're rejecting the object of faith, which is God. Then they are immoral degenerates. The moral degenerate rejects the function of faith, which is to, which is to put faith or trust in God. They're rejecting that. They're rejecting the idea of putting their faith in God. They're, they're not saying there is no God, but they're rejecting the idea of faith which is put towards God. They reject that. In other words, they put their faith in their works. Again, the pagan immoral degenerate, which is all in chapter 1 there, rejects the object of faith which is God. Of course, they are unbelievers. But here we have the moral degenerate rejecting the function of faith, which is to put faith or trust in God. They're not doing it. They're putting their faith in works. And they are unbelievers as well. They're completely different in how they go about it. But both of them are in degeneracy and both of them are condemned. Well, the Jew or Gentile, those who presume to judge the sins of others, condemn themselves because they are equally guilty. Now, these are legalists. These are moralists. That's why when they were, someone was reading the letter to the Romans, and they were looking, they were hearing this and they were cheering, oh, these are horrible. This is just, you know, woe to them. But then they, they become the target. And this chapter 2, verse 1, starts talking about them. They didn't see that coming. They are self-righteous. They think that they can be good enough to impress God, that he will welcome them into his house, into heaven, based on their own works, what they can do. And they were legalists because they were and judgmental on those that thought were those are the bad ones. We're the good ones. No, they're both bad. There were legalists in Rome who judged and condemned those who were committing overt sins, but didn't realize that they were just as guilty for committing mental attitude sins and sins of the tongue. They were full of malice, they were gossips, arrogant, boastful, unloving, and without mercy, which were sins included in the first sin list. Remember? So you have these people who were self-righteous, they're legalists, and they were judging those in, who were guilty of the first list. And they were condemning them. But in it, really they were condemning themselves because there were sins in that list of malice, gossips, arrogant, boastful, unloving, without mercy. And all those are either middle attitude sins or sins of the tongue. And they didn't even consider those sins. Don't we have that today? Don't we have so many churchgoers that are pious and self-righteous and they look at the sins, the overt sins, <clears throat> and there's enough of them to go around. Fornication and drugs and um, carousing and drunkenness. I mean, all these things. And they, they, these people look at them and say, oh, those, those are so horrible. And they judge them and condemn them for what they're doing. But they're doing essentially the same thing in rebelling against God, but it's a different type of sin. Mental attitude sins. A lot of people don't even make a distinction between, between the categories of sin, and they discount mental attitude sins because they're harder to see. 
And sometimes they're completely invisible. People can be judging you. They can be hating you. They can be full of uh, anger at you and hide it. It's just as deadly. God condemns that as well. So again, there were legalists in Rome who judged and condemned those who were committing overt sins but didn't realize that they were just as guilty for committing middle attitude sins and sins of the tongue. They just weren't as visible and, it, and to them, they didn't even count. And then they were committing all these these sins, malice, gossips, arrogant, boastful, unloving, without mercy, that were in the list as well. And that list is in Romans chapter 1, verse 29 through 31. There's about 17 sins in there. And that, some of them are middle attitude sins, some of them sins of the tongue that they were guilty of, but all they were focusing on were the overt sins. Okay, I've got... Morality and the believer. I have several points here, so I, I'm numbering them. And the reason we're going to morality because these people who are legalists and self-righteous think that they are moral. And because they are moral, they're better than those who are immoral. Immor immorality is the overt sins. Those are the immoral, uh, immoral degeneracy. And since they're not immoral, they think they're better than the ones who are. But they are just as bad because they are in moral degeneracy. It's just a, a different way of living and it's a better than thou. Okay, point number one. This is under the morality and the believer. Morality is for the entire human race, including believers. Everyone is to be moral. Oh. Excuse me. Uh, it doesn't mean they are moral. It means they're incumbent. They're, they are to be moral. And it's not just believers or unbelievers. There's no distinction. All mankind is to be, at the least, moral. Point number two. Morality is essential for orderly function in society and includes divine institutions as well as divine establishment principles relating to authority. So it is morality isn't a bad thing. It's a good thing. Because a, a nation cannot survive if all of its people are immoral. And one reason we're in desperate straits is because immorality has been front and center for a long time and it's been accepted as the norm. And one reason it's being accepted because people have turned their back on God. You take God out of the picture and anything goes. It's just your choice. That's your freedom. You can do it. But if you choose to worship God, they can't have that. I think one reason is because it shines a light on their degeneracy, their immoral degeneracy. So mor morality is part of the divine institutions and a divine establishment which, uh, principles which are necessary for a nation to survive. And one reason we're about no longer surviving is because look at the immorality. I mean, it used a lot of this immorality used to occur, but you didn't you didn't see it, and it wasn't accepted, but now it is. Gross immorality. Point three, many relate morality with, the spiritual, uh, with spirituality and believe that being moral is the way to execute the Christian way of life. That's what they think. That's, if you're a believer, then your job on earth now is to be moral. And if you are a moral person, then God is going to accept you and that's all that's required of you is to be moral. That is their standard. 
But of course that can't be true because many unbelievers are moral. In fact, a lot of unbelievers are more moral than believers. But they can be believer, uh, excuse me, can be moral. Unbelievers can be moral. So the standard for Christians has to be something else. It has to be higher than that. But that would be a newsflash to millions of believers. They have never been taught anything about spirituality. <laughs> a number of years ago, Someone that went to this church had a teenager, I think it was in the Lutheran church, and it was, had to do with confirmation. And somehow they got their, <coughs> excuse me, their hands on the confirmation test, and they gave it to me. And I looked through the whole thing, it was probably, I don't know, eight or ten pages, <coughs> several questions. Every single question in it was about morality. There was not one question, not one syllable in there about anything that is spiritual. And yet, a lot of these people put their trust in your confirmation. You've been confirmed now. Oh, I'm confirmed in their mind to go to heaven because they passed this test. It's all about morality. Nothing about spirituality. They don't know anything about spirituality. If you go to them and say something about the filling of the Holy Spirit, that's a spiritual... They don't know what you're talking about. If you tell them something about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they'll look at you like, what? And that's, that's tragic. Because these people, if they are depending on their morality to get to heaven, that's good works, and they're not even saved. And they depend on this morality thinking that they are pleasing God. And there are unbelievers that are doing the same thing, maybe even better than they are. This is huge. It's so tragic. I, I'm not just, I said Lutherans, but it, 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 most denominations. So it's important for us to understand that the Christian way of life is superior to just morality. Unbelievers can do that. Point number four. The Apostle Paul calls the believer to live according to a rule higher than morality. How do we know? Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, verse 2. I also have it on the... on the screen up here. So Apostle Paul here is requiring or calling believers to live according to a higher standard than morality. And this isn't the only one. We'll go to another verse as well. So when you go to Romans chapter 8, in verse 1, you probably recognize this verse. It's a very uh, popular verse. Most people have heard it or know it. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, you already know the importance of those in Christ Jesus, what those words are. I know, or at least I think I know that you know what being in Christ Jesus means. First of all, it means you're a believer. And also, you ought to know, if you've been around here for any length of time, what it means and how you received it. The moment you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and put your faith alone in him, then you are identified with him forever, permanently, it is called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Baptism there meaning identified with. Nothing can change that for all eternity. It's the Holy Spirit identifying you with Jesus Christ, and it's permanent. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, excuse me. Uh, let's see. 12, 13. I'll take you there to it. 1 Corinthians chapter 
<clears throat> what is it? Oh, I'm, no wonder it's not there. I'm looking in Romans. <laughs> I'm trying to find 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 in Romans. It's not working. Okay, I want you to go there. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you need to really highlight this verse because most people don't know that there is a spirit baptism. They only know about the wet ones. There are four dry baptisms and three wet ones. The dry wet, uh, baptiz baptisms are the ones where God the Holy Spirit is doing something. And something really happens. Something really changes. The three wet ones are ritual baptisms. And they may, may refer to something, but there's not a real change. But there is in a dry baptism, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a dry baptism. And it means identification. Now look at verse 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit, that would be the Holy Spirit, We were all, underline all, that's every believer. He's talking to believers here. For by one Spirit, the Holy Spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Baptism there means identification, identified with one body. What might that be? The body of Christ. That's what we are. We are the body of Christ. whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and were all, again, all, made to drink of one spirit. And I believe that's referring to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit that happens when you believe in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit identifies you with Christ from then on permanently. That's why every time you see in the Bible, it says, for those who are in Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I think it's verse 10 or, 10 or 11, 12, right in there. It says, for those who are in Christ, and then it says all these things. It means you are a believer, you are identified with Jesus Christ permanently, and it's a spiritual thing. Most people, when they see the word baptized, they only think of water and ritual baptism. This is a real baptism. Notice it's in the past tense. It's not something you're going to get. It's something you already have. It took place when you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I wanted to show you that. So when we're looking at Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, we look at it with fresh eyes now. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You, know, you, you understand the, the meaning there now. And verse 2 is where we're really focusing on here, though. Verse 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, underline that, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, has set you free from the law of sin and of death. Here it is right here. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. What is that? First of all, let's look at the law of sin and death. That means you are set free of trying to obey the Mosaic law, or any law. But here would be the Mosaic law. And that's what they were trying to do. These people who are in moral degeneracy think that they can obey the law of sin, what well, is called the law of sin and death, and yet they're trying to follow it in order to be accepted by God. But 
That's null and void. Why? Because the new law, this law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, that has replaced what they were trying to do is to be saved by the law, be accepted by the law. So what is this spirit of life in Christ Jesus? Point number five. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus refers to believers who execute the Christian way of life through the filling of the Holy Spirit and the intake of Bible doctrine. It is spiritual, not physical effort to keep the law or to be moral. That's, <clears throat> this is how we execute the Christian way of life is an obedience to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And what is it? It's being filled with the Holy Spirit, being obedient. And taking in doctrine. And that's spiritual. We don't keep the law. Nobody can keep the law. The law was there in order for people to recognize that they can't keep it. They need a Savior. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So, again, for the law, this is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. When you are in fellowship and the filling of the Holy Spirit, and you are doing divine good, then you are obeying the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's what we are to execute. That's our job. That's how we execute the Christian way of life on this earth. Legalists, people who think the, the whole game is morality, miss this. They don't have a clue because they, they aren't spiritual. They don't know anything about spiritual things. Point six. Are y'all ready for point six? Okay. James chapter two, verse eight directly relates this higher law to the scriptures and how it results in our attitude towards others, both moral and immoral degenerates. So let's go to James chapter 2, verse 8. Okay, here it is on the board. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law, underline the royal law. What is the royal law? We're just talking about, about it. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's the royal law. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. So what he's doing here is connecting the royal law, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, where it means you're living your life filled with the Holy Spirit. You're growing. You're being obedient. You're taking in the word. Your momentum is going forward. Then that is going to result in Loving your neighbor as yourself. That's one of the results of living, executing the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's how we execute it. We don't execute it by being moral. We are moral, but God holds us to a higher standard than morality. Point number seven. This higher royal law encompasses morality yet without making it a standard for living the Christian way of life. 
This royal law encompasses morality. That's the least that Christians should do is be uh, moral. Even unbelievers can accomplish that. Certainly believers should. But the higher law, even though it encompasses morality, but yet it doesn't make a, uh, morality a standard for living the Christian way of life, which so many people are doing. They're going back to the Mosaic law, and they're trying to keep the law, the Ten Commandments. They don't even know what they are. They may know four or five, but if that many. And they're being, trying to be as good as they can, and they think that's how they're supposed to live. They're trying to do good, and they have no spirituality whatsoever. They don't even know what I'm talking about here. If, they, if any of them were watching now, they have no frame of reference for what I'm talking about because they are not spiritual, probably not even saved. So this higher royal law encompasses morality yet without making it a standard for the living the Christian way of life. Point number eight. Morality without the knowledge and application of Bible doctrine leads to legalism, and legalism leads to judging others, which is what we're talking about. In chapter 2, verse 1, In Romans chapter 2, verse 1, again, Therefore you are without excuse. Who? Those who are living by morality. That's their standard. Therefore you are without excuse. Every man of you who passes judgment, for in that you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. There is nobody that is successful in being moral. None of us can claim that, can we? If we can't, certainly the unbelievers can't. And they're making that the way to heaven. I'm going to be moral. I'm better than... Look, I'm so, I'm so much better than all these other people. Well, how you know? Look at moral. I'm doing all this immorality that they have. They are judging all these people that are in immoral degeneracy and they're right smack dab in the middle of moral degeneracy and don't even realize it. They are just as culpable. They are just as sinful as those they are judging. It's just different kinds of sins. So morality without knowledge spiritual knowledge and the application of Bible doctrine leads to legalism and legalism leads to judging others. These people are self-righteous hypocrites. Oh, yeah. Paul, let them have it. They, they just, just, they're, they're just disgusting. And then he turns around and says, and you, right here, Therefore, you are without excuse. He said, remember that right up the best. When he said, you are without excuse, they probably, well, when they were hearing this later, what do you mean? We, we are without excuse. Without excuse for what? They didn't realize that what they were doing. Point nine. Believers who don't know the raw law, law of Christian way of life in Christ Jesus make morality the standard for their life and fall into arrogance and moral degeneracy. And there are few that know how to execute, execute the spiritual life in Christ. The law, the, more, uh, the royal law. They don't know how to do that because they're not spiritual. They have never been taught any spiritual things. If you get around most people that go to churches, been going there for years and years, and you use a, a spiritual connotation. Like I said, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, for an example. Or being sealed with the Holy Spirit. Being indwelt with the Holy Spirit. They don't even know what you're talking about. And so they're trying to serve God on earth with morality. No spirit. See, God... If you're trying to get into heaven by being moral, it's you doing all the work. God isn't doing it. 
And you're failing miserable. You might think, oh, I'm great. I'm you know, a pompous, self-righteous jerk. And they don't even know the spiritual things and the horrible things about it. There's not many pastors out there that even know or teach the raw law of the spiritual life in Christ, in Christ Jesus. So believers who don't know the raw law of the Christian way of life in Christ Jesus make morality the standard for their life and fall into arrogance and moral degeneracy. Point number 10, and this is our last point, and it's, we're just about out of time. Point 10. Personal love from God, or I should put for God, is both ways. Personal love for God, which comes from knowing and using His Word, results in unconditional or impersonal love for both the antinomian and the legalists. The antinomian, I mean, that's, that's the hell raisers. That's the immorality degenerates. And the legalists are the moral degenerates. And through executing the law of the spiritual life of Christ, uh, the, the, the spiritual law, uh, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, by executing that, then you are going to learn the spiritual dynamics of the age that we live in and one of those is having unconditional or impersonal love for anyone you come in contact with, whether they are antinomian, immoral degenerates, or whether they're legalists, which are moral degenerates. You love them all the same. In other words, you give them the same kind of love that God gives us. Agape love. It's not based on anything that is attractive in them. It's based on the character and the doctrine that we have and living a life that is modeled like the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how he loved people. We're out of time. I think this is... I think I'll, I'll just start with these points again on Thursday. I, because between now and then, who knows what's going to happen... And I want to make sure you have this clear in your mind because it's so important. We're talking about what, how things are. And not only in our time, back in Paul's day, it was the same thing. You had the legalists that thought they were somebody. And judging the immoral degenerates, and they, they didn't see that they were just as bad, but Paul is pointing out it, pointing it out here. We'll take that up next time. Let's close. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for revealing these things to us. We're so thankful that your word is alive and power, powerful, and all the spiritual dynamics that are in there that make our life absolutely wonderful. The battles that are going on on this earth right now are spiritual. It's the angelic conflict. And those that are still trying to impress you with their morality are on the bench. They're not even on the field. We want to be out on the field. We want to be good and faithful servants that you can use, but it can't happen in ignorance. So we pray that you will help us to solidify these things in our own minds so that we can go to other believers who are still trying to make it in the, the Christian life in morality and we'll be able to explain it to them in, your, in our own words when we're scriptured to help them get out on the field as well. So we thank you for this. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.